You are listening to Fanther Tracks. Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. to keep you all waiting. I got stuck talking to Matt Smith upstairs. Well, that's as good a reason as any. He doesn't stop talking. <laughs> Couldn't shut him up. So, uh, I'm Mark from Fan the Tracks and Star Wars Insider Magazine. This is Paul Naylor, my co-host Hello. on Start Your Engines and from Making Tracks. And we're here with Rob Ems. Hello. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. How's the show going so far? Yeah, really well. I, I actually finished filming the second series last week. I had... My last day, which was a um, very cool shot with me and some stormtroopers walking. Um, well, they were just passing me by. Um, but it was very cool. It was like an iconic last Star Wars day. And uh, yeah, it was really good. But I think they've got a few more weeks left now. Um, but yeah, I think it promises to be a really great second installment of the story. So yeah. Going into that first season, we'll talk about, there's loads of other stuff to talk about, but going into that first season, what were your hopes and expectations for being involved? Because it's Star Wars, it's, it's a big yeah. deal. Well, it's always really hard because you don't know, because they don't share much of the story or the script because <clears throat> of the kind of secretive nature of the way it is and the kind of huge possibilities for leaks to happen, spoilers. Um, so they actually didn't send really a script through it was more a conversation with Tony Gilroy who uh, is the exec um, describing what my character would be and what would happen and so yeah my expectation was uh, I knew that I I would have some interesting twist in my character to play with so that was kind of a a bit of a draw and yeah I was just very excited to be in a Star Wars and and happy to be in something that like was a big throwback to like the 70s style of the original films yeah I mean your your character in season one we can talk about season one it's out there we won't talk season two but in season one your character has a particularly interesting twist how early on did you know about that uh yeah I knew about that right from the start um but I I hadn't actually seen it physically on the page written in the script for, for a, until I started the job but when I saw it and when I read the kind of elevator scene and the reveal that you know what was going on with my character I was very excited and I didn't actually realise that for the first half of that scene uh, it would just be me on a comms I thought it would be me and I don't know how I thought but actually I realised it was just me going down this very very long elevator to then meet Luthen, um, and yeah, when we did when we shot the scene, it was absolutely brilliant. But obviously, watching it the way they shot it, it was very cool, very cool scene. So yeah, and, and going in, it, I mean, it's Star Wars. We we know the the whiz bang and the, and the sci-fi, if you want to call it that, elements of it. Did yeah. you expect it to be as an actor quite so meaty? Because that's a that's a heavyweight scene that you're in there. Were yeah. you anticipating that? I did. I didn't. I. I, I knew that there would be an element of kind of needing to sort of bury my character in the background slightly for some of the series. <clears throat> so, you know, it wasn't sort of suspected that anything was going on. But the actual kind of reveal, yeah, I didn't anticipate being quite so meaty and that was, uh, that was fun. It was really, really good. And actually second, the second series kind of brings a bit more of that. So, yeah, it's good. So your Star Wars experience has definitely been a big, a big positive tick in the box. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, something I always wanted to do. And I think something you can only really be in once unless they like, give you a spin-off. Um, but considering this is already a spin-off, I don't think there'll be a spin-off of a spin-off. <laughs> unless they really want to make their money. But, um, but you know, so it was, it was a good chance to be in it with a really good role. And, yeah, very pleased. Doing the research for, the, for this interview... 
learning you were in Warhorse on the stage and then in the movie as well. Yes. How did that all come about? Because, I mean, yeah. getting involved with Spielberg that early in your career, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that was, that was a big surprise. I, I was doing the Warhorse play in the West End for a year and I was understudying the main role for six months, which was actually Kit Harrington playing it then. And so I was understudying Kit and um, when he left, I took over from his role and I did it for six months, but literally two weeks within taking it over. I mean, it was kind of like the dream time of being in that play. It was incredibly successful. Literally every A-list uh, royalty person was coming to that show when I was in it. And the second week, Spielberg came, saw it, and chatted to us all on the stage after. And I was kind of at the back a bit and really exhausted because it was a very tiring part. And I, I had a very small childish moment, which was like, oh, I wish I was at the front, you know. But I stayed at the back and thought, you know, shut up, whatever. Went down to my dressing room and then got a knock on the door and he was standing outside and wanted to talk to me. So that was obviously a surprise. He came in and asked me if I wanted to, you know, have a film career, to which I said, uh, no, I love doing theatre. Um, which maybe... <laughs> maybe it was more appealing to him I don't know but um, and then yeah I didn't hear from him for a long time he did say that there was possibly a role in the film that he was thinking of me for and then I got an invite to go and read the script um, read the script and then they offered me the role so yeah it was really lovely and he, he was very sweet to me and introduced me to my my then American agents and helped me a little bit in Los Angeles. So, yeah, lovely person to have met and worked with. Hey, man, it's me, Kevin Smith, Star Wars fan, Fanta Tracks fan. And when you're going on stage, and it's a packed audience anyway, and a hit show that everybody's talking about, yeah. I remember seeing loads of Warhol stuff back in the day on television. Yeah. Do you know that somewhere in that crowd, Steven Spielberg is there, or do they make sure they don't oh. tell you that? <laughs> no, we knew that he was in, because they'd already announced the film, and there was like a sort of you know, a buzz that... I mean, I think, yeah, we, we knew that he would come and see it at some point. And no, we, we, we knew that he was in. So um, we also had the Queen come to see the show at one point. And she actually booked out three rows... Well, she didn't. Her, her people did. <laughs> She's on the phone to Ticketmaster uh, booking them right, out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She had three rows of just completely booked out for her security around her and um, I think we had to I can't remember we had to start the show late because they get it was a very it was a big procedure but yeah there was we had George Clooney we had Emma Thompson we had uh, Spielberg Scorsese we had Morgan Freeman wow. um, the Fonz I mean literally it was night every night there was a legend in the audience. It was, it was a great time to be doing a show. It must have been weird having the Queen, not just because it's the Queen, but because she was so into her horses, so she knows the movements yeah. and the, yeah. She was, she was. I was very gullible at the time because someone said to me she was gonna come back and meet the puppets, which often people did. So I thought, she's, I'm sure she's gonna come back, you know, because people do uh, to meet us. And, and she didn't in the end. And one of the other actors was like, yeah, because she, she's got a restaurant reservation, so she couldn't come, which I stupidly believed. So, obviously, <laughs> she didn't have a reservation at Nando's. You reminded me, Paul, that Robert yeah. was in Kick-Ass 2. Yeah, yeah. What was that like, the experience on that? Yeah, Kick-Ass 2 was really good. I mean, um, kind of um, fun thing to be a part of. Yeah. I mean, I got a rash at the end of it because I wore this wetsuit thing for three months and I got a really bad itch, which I thought was bed bugs or something. And I was paranoid about everything. I, I put so many creams on. I was like, what the hell is it? And then I realized it's because I was wearing this wetsuit kind of superhero costume for like three months in the summer and my skin wasn't breathing. Anyway, totally <laughs> random story, but that's my memory of Kick-Ass 2. Because that became quite a prominent role. Did you know it was going to be... Yeah, um, it was, yeah, fairly. I mean, it was, it was part of Jim Carrey's little crew, yeah. and, uh, yeah, it was good. It was good to work with Jim Carrey. He's a, you know, a, a, a character yeah, himself. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. 
So going, going back uh, briefly to, to Star Wars, were you a fan as a, as a youngster? Was it something that you I was, you Yeah, I, I was a fan as a youngster. I, <clears throat> I, I mostly liked uh, A New Hope and uh, The Empire Strikes Back were my two favourites. I think I really loved the 70s, you know, design of it, which wasn't 70s at the time. It was just what it was. Yeah. But, like, you know, it was, I loved that feel and I like the way they've kind of thrown back to that. Um, and obviously the, the, the way that they, they dressed you and, and the fact that you've got the moustache and everything yeah. looked fitting very nicely yeah, the, with that aesthetic. The sideburns and the moustache, yeah. 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 So... So, which, what was, so what was it like that first day when you saw the uniform and you put it on? You thought, yeah, we had a lot of costume fittings because they like to get those costumes looking very, very neat. And yeah. if you, you know, because it's such a kind of stark set, the way it is that, that place where we filmed it, there was a lot of, um, you know, visuals. You could see literally everything, every stain, every crease. So... They were really careful to make sure at all times they looked in incredibly smart and clean cut. So, yeah, it was good to wear it. It was a good uniform. It felt restrictive, which was good for my character because he obviously is being restricted and, you yeah. know, suffocate. He's kind of under pressure. So, yeah, but it was important for my character to play, to play the part well. So, you know, um, so people didn't suspect. I, I don't know if anyone did suspect it. I... I, I no, I don't think no, so. No, so not, yeah. no, no, no idea. No, no. Yeah. It was a real good, uh, good, twist. good lead up to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And like you say, you were, you were, you were visible but kind of hidden. Yeah. You, nobody would have suspected it kind of no. idea. So it was very good. I think yeah. someone said to me, and it was a very flattering thing to say, and I liked it. <laughs> someone, <laughs> said, someone said, I knew it might have been you because I thought you might not have said yes to that part if, uh, if it didn't have some kind of interesting twist, yeah. which is true. <laughs> so I, I, I was all about the twist on it definitely brilliant one of the noticeable things was Tony Gilroy sort of described it as wanting to make a Star Wars show without making it feel like a Star Wars show he's focusing more on the drama than on the Star Warsness of it yeah as a consequence it ends up being one of the most Star Wars projects that's ever been put out there so when you're going into that and, and you're talking to Tony, as you said, you know, what, what's his focus where does he want this to where's the, where does he want the weight to be on this um, I, yeah, I think he's all about you know the relationships and and um, making things as sort of layered as possible. Um, but he's a great writer because he layers things and he makes things complex whilst also creating a sort of simplicity at the same time. So that's kind of what great art can be, and that's what this is in that sense. And it has so many modern political undertones. Um, <clears throat> so. But the focus really was... And the focus he had with me was really making sure that Lonnie Young was giving the best performance of his life uh, as, a, as a... Can I say it? Because I don't know if everyone's seen yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, no, you a just spy, so, so, yeah. Yeah, so that was really, really important, you know. No, you're just saying that makes me think in that because he is who he is, because he's essentially a double agent, that he that all we see until the reveal, even for Lonnie, is yeah. a performance. Yeah, totally. Yeah, the whole thing's a performance. Yeah, yeah. he's, he's kind of learned that role uh, very well. But, and also been doing it for a lot of years, so yeah. he has become very accomplished at it. So it was never about, and this was strong conversations with Tony about this, never about showing any kind of fear or uh, worried looks or tension within the ISB. In the ISB, he has to be strategic focused cutthroat and he has to be almost the best ISB officer in the room yeah no it's great misdirection because we're all focusing on Dedra and her trying to get up the ladder yeah. and not and you, you sort of goes by the by yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. yeah for everything in one location daily news reviews interviews podcasts video and social media feeds bookmark fanthatracks.com for Star Wars news 24-7 365 One of your other roles, which I thought was a great, was a great little part in the film, Jurassic, uh, Jurassic Park Fallen, or Jurassic World Falling Jurassic Kingdom. Jurassic World, like. yes. Yeah. How did that come about? Because obviously, as I said, you've got this Spielberg connection and he's yeah. an exec producer on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, I didn't really... I mean, I knew he was an exec producer, but I don't know if he... I think he probably watches it and looks at the edit and stuff, but he doesn't really have a say in the casting. I, I actually 
got a phone call for that from my agent and <clears throat> it was to go and meet the director and I actually read the scene and thought I don't really want to audition for this <laughs> um, because it's like only a six minute scene and it's very action based and I don't really want to go and pretend to do action stuff I'd rather just say no to it it's not that I was being arrogant but I was like you weren't feeling it no I was like you can take it or leave it it's, it's really amazing franchise to be a part of and it was a great scene to do but I was very much like, you know, I'm not auditioning for that. Because I've done so many running through woods, running through here, doing action. You can just watch me doing that, and then you can just give it to me. But, um, which they finally did. So then they just offed it. Um, and then I was obviously pleased to do it. And then in the end, it became more than I thought it was. It became a really cool sequence. Yeah. And, uh, the, you know, there was a, a poster with my little legs dangling off a ladder. It was quite cool. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so it was, it was a good job to do in the end. I really enjoyed it. Do you like the mixture? Because Star Wars is, a, especially Andor, is a weird mix because the focus is on the drama, but it's still action, it's still Star Wars. And then you go and do something like Happy Valley, which is very much in that drama realm. Do you like the mix between doing the two things? Yeah, I'm just very lucky, really, to be honest with you. I would, I would love to say it's a choice. I mean, it, I suppose it maybe has been a choice, but it's also, I think it's been the way that I, I've. Been luck I've been lucky to straddle the two things of the more um, big productions, big films with big budgets and the more independent side or the more BBC kind of interesting drama. I'm very lucky to be able to do those two things. Uh, I'm very aware of that, actually. So, um, yeah, long may it continue. Yeah. <laughs> and is there still a lot of theatre work? Is that on your radar? Is that something you still enjoy doing? I love doing theatre. I don't do enough of it. I don't get enough of it. I mean, I, I'm sort of... I, I think I've done so much TV and film that it's... I'm not quite in that world. So uh, I did do a play right before COVID at the, uh, in London. <clears throat> and I'm aiming to do another one again. So, yeah, we'll see. Hopefully, fingers crossed. It just makes me think when you said, oh, I, I want to stay in the theatre, and Spielberg saying, do you want to be in the theatre? Oh, I want to be in the theatre. It just sounds like such a British thing to say. Yeah, I was also quite young. I was only 20, uh, 23, 22, 23. So I was very much like, you know, just out of drama school, and I was really all about the theatre. Just wanted to be at the National Theatre doing plays. And so, you know, as much as Spielberg standing in front of me was really, really cool, I was... I, was, um, I, I, I did have a different focus, but... I did have a slightly embarrassing moment when he um, he left the the room and he went round the corner and I literally started going like that, <laughs> making a noise, and I didn't realise that he was still there. <laughs> and so you must have heard that, I'm sure. But actually, Kathleen Kennedy, who um, it, it produced Warhorse, she also met me that night. She was there with him and his wife. And she is actually the exec producer of uh, of Andor. Yes, so, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And when you know you, you, you perform on stage, that's one discipline. You do te television and film; that the lines are fairly blurred now between the two. Do they feel like two completely different disciplines, or, or is it essentially the same thing for an actor? It is slightly different. I mean, it, it, in the sense that, like, TV is more. It's very. It's, it's everything set out the story the plot it's all there it's all kind of um, it, it, you've got like many episodes to build a story it's much more of like a puzzle I'd say whereas a film is a bit more like a painting in the sense that the director is like an artist and they're sort of creating their visual idea in one in one thing so they can slightly be more less restricted with their ideas and because a film can take many different shapes partly because of that so yeah that, I just feel those two things like a TV is more like a puzzle and film is more like an abstract painting it can, be, it can form itself in many different ways so um, yeah do you have a question? That, that's, that's a really good way of looking at things yeah so with um, obviously modern TV series, particularly the ones that are coming out onto Disney Plus and, and Netflix, that kind of thing, where actors who traditionally wouldn't have appeared in TV are now embracing that format. 
Are you not finding that, I mean, particularly with Andor, where we kind of have an end game to it because of Rogue One, that does feel a bit more like a film? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, any kind of TV series that you do where you know that there's an end point does feel like a big, more cinematic experience. It's got like a, a beginning, middle and end. And it's, yeah, and that's actually very satisfying. It's sometimes, I think, when a series doesn't have its end point, it can, it, it does run the risk of becoming a bit repetitive or, you know, like, and, and, it, and it can lose people after a second or third series, maybe four series, but that's the risk. But then you get, I think that's why Andor probably would have done very well with five years because of having that full stop it had to yeah. reach to. Um, but, uh, yeah. But, yeah, it's just the second series now coming. So. And the show has been so well received, not only by the fandom, but also by critics, and, and it's been getting loads of award nominations. Again, obvious question, but that must be satisfying to be involved with a project like that when all of us... Yeah, and especially with Diego, because coming from Rogue One and then being so heavily involved with yeah. this and it being so well received... Again, did you anticipate that? You, you, I guess you go into a Star Wars project thinking a you certain thing. You never know with these things because they are quite packaged machines. You know, it's Disney, it's Star Wars. It's, it's a, it's a money-making machine, really. But actually, I was surprised with the level of, like, critical acclaim from quite serious reviewers. You know, like, like The Guardian yeah. gave it five stars. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's really cool. You know, that's not normal for The Guardian to give, like, a more commercial piece of, of filmmaking five stars. So it felt like, actually, this feels quite important. And I think because it did have those modern political undertones, and um, that didn't, you know, people didn't, you know, people appreciated it's watching qu- It's that. structured quite differently from anything else that Star Wars has done in the past. It, it feels more like a novel, because it, it, it's given time to breathe. Yeah. Some episodes would normally have been condensed down into like yes. a 10 minute scene that, that are allowed to breathe and that's yeah. been interesting as a viewer to see that hasn't it yeah and i think that's given it a, a unique feel as well hi this is david w collins voice actor for star wars and sound designer at skywalker sound you are listening to fan tracks are you happy to take a couple of questions from the yeah, audience absolutely more than happy yeah uh, does anybody have any questions providing no. it has nothing to do with andor season two <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, I can't actually share anything. Are we going to mic and pop out? There you go. Hi. So, Hello. Robert, you were one part of uh, an amazing uh, scene. Uh, you, you mentioned about when you was in the lift and on your way to, to listen to this amazing monologue being given by Stellan Starsgard. Were you on set facing him when, you were giving that, when he was giving that speech? And did you have a little in your eye because I still do whenever I, t- whenever I hear it <laughs> yeah I was yeah we, we shot that scene um, in a very strange water old water factory pumping factory thing it was weird we went down down this concrete chamber <clears throat> and then into this part where they'd built this lift entrance it, it, it was really what, it, what you saw apart from obviously the, the actual bit where it went on 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 but, um, yeah, so we were there doing that for a day. And, yeah, so when, when it came round to Stellan, Stellan doing that monologue, I was, um, yeah, we, we'd been doing it for quite a while. So I was there, loved it, yeah. I did have a tear in my eye. I did. It was, it was a powerful moment for my character, really, because it's uh, someone who's completely trapped in a system and um, stuck between a rock and a hard place, you know. Or completely... But I can't <laughs> say that word. <laughs> it did feel like that, though, you, your situation. And again, when you went into the role, did you know that your character had this family background with, with people that were relying on him as much as... Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I did, I did. I knew it was a, I was a case that we wouldn't see it that in the first series as such, but it'd be more sort of like... Um, it'd be more like his his like dilemma with being stuck in the empire as a yeah sec- as a double agent. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to say, I write for the official magazine, and me and Sander on the front wrote the this month's yes. cover article, by the way, uh, which was Andor locations, and we couldn't quite figure out where <laughs> where that was shot. It yeah. was quite interesting. 
I can't actually remember what it, where it was. I, I can't remember for the life of me, but that, it, was, it was a sort of a, yeah, like a water pump, pumping yeah. chamber, whatever, yeah. Do we have any more questions? Yep. Ah, there you go. Good, good. Hiya. Um, can you tell us a bit about when you worked on the Atlantis TV show, please? When I was doing Atlantis, did you say? Yeah. Atlantis, yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I love doing that. That was a brilliant series to do, uh, partly just for the friendships that I got from, you know, from all the actors in it, especially Mark and Jack, Sarah Parrish, Jemima Rupa. Love, love those people. Um, yeah, it was, it was just a very fun show to do. It was like a kind of, you know, silly, nice kind of vibe between the three of us. Um, it was long, long days Lot, lots of days spent in a forest, in the forest of Dean. Um, beautiful, but, you know, long days. And, um, and yeah, just, I, I loved it. It was great. And it was good exercise because we did lots of sword fighting and running around. We had two weeks in Morocco filming. So life's gone downhill since I cancelled <laughs> it. Let's put it that way. Do you enjoy throwing yourself into a role and just losing yourself in it for a while? Is that an attraction? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is, I suppose. I don't want to do a, too much of a series where I get, you know, so pigeonholed into one character. I wouldn't like to do that so much unless they paid me, you know, loads of money. Well, yeah. So. <laughs> well, you'll be coming back to things like this for a long time, obviously, because of, because of Star Wars. Have you Hopefully. enjoyed the interaction with the fans? You enjoy talking about yeah, it? Yeah, it's great. It's so nice to meet, you know, people after seeing the first series and the feedback and hearing what people, you know, thought about it. Um, and, and I was following, you know, online people's comments, not, not kind of in a vain way, but just more because uh, I wanted to see how people reacted to the, the twist and people were, you know, really excited by it. And that was, that was good. And it, was, it wasn't expected. So, um, so it's been nice to meet some new Star Wars fans. I've met some fans from Atlantis before and meeting some more Chernobyl and Star Wars fans this year has been, has been particularly particularly nice brilliant there's lots to look forward to in Andor season 2 and one of those elements is obviously what happens to Yoni so yes yeah. yes which this is when you have to cut my microphone uh, <laughs> yeah because actually what happens is no that doesn't <laughs> yeah. and you heard it here first <laughs> brilliant well thanks for your time we really yeah, so, appreciate yeah, it thanks nice to meet you Robert. Robert. a big round of applause for Robert thank you, thank you. Thanks for listening to Making Tracks. If you want to be a part of the action and stay updated on all the latest Star Wars news, visit PantherTracks.com or check out the free Panther Tracks app through the App Store to follow us on your mobile device. You can reach out to us to send your listeners questions by emailing radio at PantherTracks.com. Comment, like and share on any of our social media feeds at Panther Tracks. And be sure to subscribe, leave a review, preferably a five-star one, on Amazon Music, Audible, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcast or smart speaker of choice. And as always, thanks to James Semple for composing the Panther Tracks intro, Adam O'Brien for making tracks out with music and Mark Daniel and Vanessa Marshall for our voiceovers remember tune in to Good Morning Tatooine it's live Sunday evenings at 9 o'clock UK 4pm Eastern 1pm Pacific on Facebook and YouTube and check out our Fantasy Tracks Radio Friday Night Rotation every Friday night at 7pm UK time for new episodes of the Phantom From Down Under Planet Layer Desert Planet Discs Start Your Engines Collecting Tracks Cannon Fodder and special episodes of Making Tracks and that's me done for this episode Coming up next on Fantha Tracks Radio it's another episode of Making Tracks.